Good afternoon, APMP. It's Friday. It's the 16th of October, and welcome to BidX, the UK's virtual festival for bid professionals. We hope you can see and hear us loud and clear in glorious Technicolor. I'm still Pete Morris, and we're back in our beautiful BidX studios here in Manchester. Wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for joining us. We truly have an action-packed 90 minutes for you. But before we talk about any of that, a couple of things that might help your enjoyment of today's show. If you can hear me and see me, you've obviously downloaded our app, either on your laptop, tablet, or phone. It is possible and preferable to gorge yourself on a multi-platform experience and have us on as many devices as you damn well please. Our tech experts tell us the best way for you to experience the next 90 minutes is to watch from your laptop or tablet and get interactive with us from your phone. There are many, many ways that you can do that during today's show. Please feel free to send questions to us and our guests. You can do that by going to the speaker question feature on the app. I'll do my best to get as many of them answered as possible. They literally will come right through to my phone. You can also live chat with your fellow audience members. That is available right now and will continue during and well after we come off air. And that's on the social wall feature of the app. You might also want to take a look at the gamification feature where you can earn some points to win some prizes you just wouldn't believe. Can you also please make sure that at the end of the show, you complete the survey part of the app? Listen, we want to give you what you want and that's the best channel for us to get your feedback. Please make sure you do that for us. Today's episode is titled Deliverability Matters, which looks at how we address concerns around delivery, reputation, and engagement. As a result of COVID, do we need to change our industry now and also for the future? When you, our beautiful audience, talk, we listen. So today, we have only two guests for you, but we're allowing way more time to chat with them. I'll try and get as many of your questions answered. Keep hitting us up on the app with those. I think we'll get on with it. Our first guest is Ben Page. Ben is the CEO of Ipsos Mori, which is the UK's principal market research company. He's polled for major political parties, government agencies, and local authorities. So if anybody knows what we're all thinking right now, it's probably Ben and Google, and probably Facebook. Ben is also a professor at King's College in London, and he's a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. Ben, welcome to BidX. It's great to have you with us. Are you there, sir? There you are. I am, yeah. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, can so I'm doing the multimedia hear. experience, looking at about three screens to make this work. But it's great to be here, and um, thank you. All of the slides that I'm about to show you, because I'm afraid there are some slides, uh, are, will be available afterwards. So you don't need to write down anything unless it's very profound and funny. And you, you can uh, email me if you want anything, if I say anything particularly controversial. And you can go on Twitter if you like Twitter. And yes, another platform for us. And I think that sort of state of pressure on our attention is just a reminder of the the way many of us spend a lot of our days now, which is partly why sometimes we feel absolutely knackered. Now, listen, I'm going to talk about how Britain will change as a result of COVID-19. I'm going to talk about what's going to happen to the economy and the jobs market in the UK. And I'm going to talk about the progress of the disease and what's going to happen. However, of course, what you've got to remember is that people like me, experts, are generally according to the work of uh, Professor Philip Tetlock, generally the work of experts like me is only about 5% more accurate than random chance. And so whether you're looking at the fields of politics, economics, business, sport, uh, you will generally find that expert predictions, as he says, are only on average about 5% better than random chance. If any of you work for a hedge fund, a 5% margin would be massive and you'd be able to go and make millions out of it. But it just is a reminder that to, to use a colloquial expression, shit happens. When we asked people all over the world what the biggest threat to their health would be, 
during the course of 2020, they mentioned uh, things like, uh, you know, obesity, cancer, heart disease, etc. But only four people in 100 globally mentioned something like SARS or COVID-19. So generally predictions about the future are hard. Opinion polls are on the Monday and Tuesday of the week of an election can be highly accurate. But when we start to talk about how Britain might be changing on some of the things that are going to, what's going to stick and what won't stick, I do think we need to remember that. Having said that, um, there are a whole load of things that we can see um, hoving into view as I wait for my slides to move forward um, uh, that are, you know, that are definitely uh, signals of, of change. So in no particular order, um, we are seeing, of course, as the New York Times put it, social distancing. You might be fighting climate change, too. Many of you will be traveling much less and probably producing less carbon in many ways than you were before the outbreak of the disease. So do we see a massive uh, green reset? We didn't see that after 2008, when actually immediately after the recession, gradually carbon emissions started to rise. But now maybe we will fly less in future. And maybe uh, when we look at other things going on in terms of trying to stimulate the economy, we might see a big green rebuild. We may see massive investment in green infrastructure and digital infrastructure. So possibly uh, we'll see a green reset. We can certainly see a digital acceleration, many of us using technologies that we rarely used uh, on a daily basis uh, seven or eight months ago. And now, of course, they are meat and drink to us. And that, that digital acceleration does look as though parts of it will be here to stay. And I want to talk a bit about that. We also have fear of the future. One of the most striking things about Britain, but also America and most of Europe before COVID-19, was in a sense the loss of the future, which explains some of our politics. So in Britain in 2019, 45% of people expected their children to be poorer than them. The figure back in 2003, before the crash of 2008, was only 12%. So you've got four, nearly half the population who are expecting their children to be poorer than them. And that's before the economic impact of the pandemic makes itself known fully. And I think that's a challenge because nine out of 10 people in Britain and in America and in Europe believe the natural state of affairs is that each generation should be better off than the one that preceded it. The kids will always, you know, children will always be better off than their parents ultimately. When we lose that future, we start to become pretty angry. Um, the, the growth that we have seen since World War II in Britain seems to be at an end. And that's making people become worried, whether it's stockpiling, you know, uh, in the short term toilet rolls or joining populist movements. And populism, of course, is simply the revolt against the elite, whichever it is. You know, that looks like it's there. But I think the challenge on politics is that it took four years after the great crash of 2008 for the surge in populism that we saw with Nigel Farage in Britain, Donald Trump in America, Bolsonaro in Brazil, all of that stuff to start becoming visible in our societies. And so exactly how this plays out again might be too soon to see. One thing that we can see is generally a rise in nostalgia, and we always see that in recessions, combined with a fear of going out. And most people in Britain currently believe that the restrictions that the government has now put in place are, too, um, are not strict enough rather than too strict. Only 15% of people believe that the current restrictions are too strict. You can see people with less money retreating to home and going back to sort of simple pleasures. So depending on which sector you're in, there are opportunities for IKEA, there are opportunities for supermarkets, people will obviously be eating out less, but we may be seeing that sort of return to simple pleasures that we saw after 2008. Uh, the rise of knitting uh, became a big thing, home DIY, all of this sort of stuff. May, we may again see that over the next 18 months or so. Certainly the recession and its impacts and the way it unfolds are likely to benefit big brands. They have the financial ammunition to make it through the crisis. And the other thing that is in their favor is that during uh, crises, what we see is that um, people tend to go back to the brands from their childhood, the ones they know and love. So somebody like General Mills, who makes Cheerios, for example, is investing millions in advertising to reinforce that advantage. And small challenger brands may find this period quite hard. For, the, for some of your clients, again, this may be beneficial. The other thing we're seeing 
is the rise of purpose. We saw that during lock, the first lockdown as people like Louis Vuitton or this turned their perfume production line and the beer company like this one, Bavaria in Holland, turns its beer production line into making hand sanitizer. But more generally, I think particularly in a year with Black Lives Matter, um, we're seeing a rise of demands for purpose in business, and I'll, I'll come back to that. And I think, again, some of that is likely to stick. We've also got more people exercising, um, and that's probably useful, because if you're anything like me, and 29% of the population are, you will have been drinking more in lockdown. And so do we see, um, particularly when you're only allowed to go out to exercise in some cases and in some parts of the UK, a continued rise in interest in health and fitness combined with a dangerous pandemic? And then, of course, the other thing we're seeing is big government. The government is now spending the sorts of money um, that it only normally spends in wartime. The level of government spending is now similar as percentage to World War I or World War II. How long does that go on for and how long, how do we sustain it and how do we pay it back? Those are all good questions, but certainly, at least with zero interest rates, government is going to be spending money in ways that somebody like Rishi Sunak would have only, if I had told Rishi Sunak in December that he was going to be chancellor and he would be spending much more money than even um, Jeremy Corbyn had anticipated by, by the summer, he would have said, you know, take a hike, you've had some uh, interesting tobacco. Uh, but of course, actually, there it is. Um, and so these are all signals of change that we can see. The question is, which of these become permanent? We've only been in this crisis, although it feels like a long time, for a few months. After six years of World War II, Britain emerged and fundamentally changed as a society. Many of the things that we take for granted now, like the National Health Service, universities, the welfare system, our education system, were all fundamentally changed or established by World War II. Whether we're going to see those sorts of changes as a result of COVID is not yet clear. We are too close to the trees to see the forest. But there are things that, of course, we can see. Um, so the first thing, I think, is that digital acceleration. Um, we can see that, you know, all the time we've got this growth in online. So over the first six months of the year, we saw more growth in online commerce, online banking, etc., uh, in Britain and in America than we had seen in the previous six years. And indeed, we would have probably seen more growth if we'd actually had the physical capacity and logistics infrastructure to allow that growth to happen. And so I think as people discover online shopping for the first time, as they discover online banking, and the banks will use the epidemic as an excuse to close loads of the branches that they wanted to close before the epidemic, particularly as nobody wants to go into them anymore, um, you know, we will see that online shift, I think, becoming permanent. Where you can see a trend that was there before the crisis, it's very likely to have stuck if it's been amplified by the crisis crisis. Um, pro home working, of course, as, we, as many of us are doing now, um, and most people overall tend to say that if they are working at home, it's improved their work-life balance, and some people say their diet, but it's not um, helping their ability to collaborate with colleagues and well-being. Well, the jury's out on well-being. Um, overall, half the population say it hasn't had any impact on their mental health, but a lot of people are feeling trapped at home, feeling isolated, uh, and generally women are suffering more than men. And in particular, if there are any working women with kids at home, on this call, uh, absolutely, this is the group, I think, that in many ways have borne the brunt. Women always do more housework than men, um, even when the men are present in the home all day and aren't going out to work. And, of course, they also take more responsibility for looking after kids. So 45% of women say that over a working age, women with children at home, so they've, their mental health has suffered. And I think this is something that we will need to look at and think about as we go forward, and so will our clients. Um, other things, uh, you know, generally the young as a whole, say it's going to impact their social life, 45%. People in my age group, 55 to 75, rather less, but then our social life is probably less exciting. People with parents, uh, again, saying that they're, they're feeling impacted. And of course, as well as working age women at home, if you're younger, um, you, and particularly if you're where, the, where, of course, people are concentrated in those sectors that have had the biggest number of layoffs and the biggest impact, you will also be suffering. Um, and I think generally, you know, it's the, it's the impacts in many ways are sort of beyond the virus. So we found, you know, in May, 48% of people said they put on weight, 29% uh, drinking more than they would, loneliness rising, and um, people putting off uh, medical treatment. 
one of the things that my friend Michelle uh, Mitchell, who's CEO of Cancer Research UK, told me the other day, is that between they, they've estimated crudely between 30 to 100,000 people will die early of cancer, either because they'll miss screening appointments that should have happened, um, or because operations would have been put off. So, you know, these are real these are real world impacts that we are going to see as a result of the virus. And, you know, there's some trade-offs. Interestingly, though, despite the um, the trade-offs that people have to make, what we're seeing is that um, overall, only 27 percent of people believe that the controls that the government has put in place are doing more harm than good. And six out of 10 people say that we need to do whatever it takes to control the virus. And interestingly, that just hasn't changed since May. So the, the public is very cautious and they want things to um, they want the government to do what it takes. So in terms of what happens next, I think it's important to remember that, you know, as I've said, it takes a long time, even with a massive shock like COVID-19, that means that we're all at home and massively changing our behaviours. Does that really change the new normal? If a vaccine was available and could be sent to everybody in Britain today and you took a small pill um, and ultimately then tomorrow normal life could resume as before, you know, how different would things be? I tell you, I would be heading straight probably for an airport to go somewhere. So, you know, we don't know yet. But what I, and I think the other thing to remember is that what we're measuring is, in a sense, three things. We measure um, people's uh, opinions. We measure their uh, values. Let me go back. Um, get the right slide here, trying to do too many things at once. Whoops. Um, and so what one needs to remember is that, you know, we're looking both at opinions, but also attitudes and values. And in a sense, it's like the surface of the sea. Uh, so attitude, opin opinions are just bouncing around. What do you think of that guy, that speech you just saw? What do you think of Beyonce on the, on, I don't know, on TV last night? Those things bounce around like the top of the sea. Attitudes, perhaps like the tides, they go in more slowly, they come out. It's like the currents. Um, what do you think of the government of the day? That changes a bit, a bit more slowly. And then your values, those change much, much more slowly. Values like what do you think about gay marriage? Values like what do you think about the death penalty? Um, values like what should I do with my life? Should I have a family or not have a family? Those things change much, much more slowly. So if you look at this, um, you know, you can see Britain here over the last uh, 20 years and you can see how British um, public opinion has or hasn't changed. And I think this is really uh, this is sort of really interesting um, because what we can see is that on many dimensions, um, let's have a look. Uh, I just try. I think I'll build this all out for you. You can see that back at the end of the last century, most people were not online. Um, so we had only uh, back in 1999, 13 percent of the UK population online. We had at the same time uh, a vast number of people, um, uh, you know, just not looking at the Internet at all. Facebook didn't exist. 9-11 and the war on terror hadn't happened. The financial crisis hadn't happened. Alexa didn't exist. Facebook didn't exist. And yet over that time, you can see nothing changed in terms of the proportion who wanted to slow down their lives. Uh, the proportion of people who felt that um, technology was going to destroy their life, uh, or even that being a big boss, I'm, I'm a CEO of a company of 1,500 people, being a big boss was going to make you happy in life. It hasn't changed. So we need, to, we need to bear that in mind. Some things in Britain have massively changed. Our attitudes to homosexuality have massively shifted over this time. Our attitude to drugs. But other things don't change, even over 20 years and with massive technological shifts. So we need to be careful about saying exactly what's going to stick and what's going to change with COVID-19. Um, what we can see, of course, is uh, some big changes in terms of what people feel about spending. If you look at the last 30 years on that, people are reacting in some cases on, on that. So, you know, look at the proportion of people who want taxes to go up or go down. And you can see uh, um, you know, a pretty massive shift uh, on that. Um, 
which is pretty it's pretty marked. We've now got the 53 percent of people saying put up taxes and spend more. And although some of you might think, well, actually, are they saying put up other people's taxes and spend more? Uh, polling we've done this year shows that two out of three people in this country say they would personally pay more taxes for the National Health Service. And given the performance of the NHS this year, generally one of the most popular institutions we can see, there is perhaps, you know, if you want to look where tax rises might eventually turn up, a hypothecated tax for the NHS might be one of them. But overall, I think what this chart shows is just how complicated our country is. What we've done here is crunch together 170 different questions that look at people's values in the round. And on this chart, which is full of full of things, of course, you can see all sorts of clusters of different values. So down in the bottom right, here you've got um, the people who feel left behind, nostalgic, worried about the future. Some of these people will have uh, voted for Brexit. They're, they feel that their part of Britain has been left behind. They're attracted to a revolt against the elites. The past is better than the present. So they're nostalgic. And those values are unlikely to be shared in mostly by people who have these values over here on the top right. Uh, these values on the top right are those of um, people, perhaps some of you on this call, generally positive about technology or into tech, uh, positive about growth, positive about actually think that capitalism, despite its problems, is the best system, liking, you know, Insta shopping, you like technology, you think globalisation has some benefits. Down on the bottom left here, traditional values of nationalism, these are more the, the values perhaps of Donald Trump. Uh, they believe that men and women have different roles in society and women should know their place. They're tired of environmentalism. It's very unlikely you'd find somebody who was a massive green person down in this corner of the chart in their values. And they believe in my country, right or wrong. Uh, so these are the 9% of Britons who believe that uh, Boris Johnson is far too left wing, um, perhaps, or some of the people there would share those values. And then perhaps the values of, of younger people up here on the top right, uh, these are the beyond, beyond binary, believing in radical change. There are more than two genders, uh, but strong belief in LGBT rights, um, although in Britain 90% say gay women and men should be free to live as they like. But you'd be unlikely to find somebody who believed in climate emergency who was also uh, a traditional nationalist. It's unlikely to happen. So those are the values of this country, which shows perhaps why for politicians it's quite hard to, to please us, because actually our values are quite, quite diverse. And when you look at Britain, um, overall, and in terms of how strongly these values are held, you can see that overall in the country, things that we tend to agree on, if not the solution, first of all, that uh, we believe that medicine, you know, we generally believe in, in proper medicine. We're not all anti-vaxxers in Britain, which is good. Strong feelings about big tech in our lives and how people like Facebook should be regulated. Uh, interestingly, at the same time, while we want to regulate big tech, we also tend to just accept the, a loss of privacy. Uh, as we heard at the beginning, Facebook but probably knows and Google know what you've been up to today. Strong agreement that there is a climate emergency, even if we don't agree on the solutions. And um, a strong agreement uh, that uh, we need some sort of wealth redistribution, that there's inequality, uh, too much inequality in our country. So those are the sort of top values in Britain. And you know, those are, you know, when we look at those things and you think about what's going to come in the 2020s, it starts to give you some clues. So people believing that there's too much inequality, people believing that the system is rigged against them. Jeremy Corbyn, of course, lost the general election last year by miles. But Boris Johnson has promised when we talk about wealth redistribution and Boris Johnson, of course, is a is a conservative, but he's talking about leveling up those places that voted for Brexit. That means perhaps London not doing quite so well in future, because you can't if you're going to level up, then that means the north catching up with the south. You can't let London keep going further and further away. So really interesting to sort of see how that plays out. And British people are not ideological. But you can see here some of the challenges facing anybody governing us in the next um, period. So as we go forward, uh, I think we have to ask the question, how is it changing our values? And there's mixed evidence on that. Um, we can, you know, these are where we're certainly seeing some change. So first of all, uh, I think a demand for brands to do more wanting brands to reflect our values, and that has gone on growing during 2020. We've also seen a massive furore around Black Lives Matters and many corporates, and I think government, 
focusing on equality, focusing on diversity, focusing on inclusion. Conversations that we're having this year were very different from previous years. So people saying they want to see chief executives like me, 68% of people are from 62% in 2019, so they want chief executives to speak out. On climate change, despite the epidemic making us worried about the economy and our jobs in the short term, we can certainly see that. Um, and of course, online retail massive growth and changes in how we feel about healthcare. These are things where we can start to see change. So, for example, I want brands that reflect my personal values. However old you are, people are more likely to say that. So, how does how does your organisation and how do your clients' organisations reflect people's their reflect the people they serve as personal values and sometimes perhaps speak up for them? That seems to be you know that seems to be more and more important. You cannot, as we say in our advice to corporates, say one thing and do something else, because if you do that, you'll find yourselves in private eye. And generally, for most businesses, being in private eye is not a good thing. Uh, other things that we can see happening, um, you know, e-tail e is interesting. So we've got this massive growth. Actually, lots of people saying they're finding it a bit more tricky to find everything they need than in traditional stores. So traditional retail won't necessarily die. We've seen, as I've shown you, that massive growth in e-commerce. But at the same time, we've actually got more young people and most age groups saying that they find online shopping more difficult, perhaps because when you finally want to get that very particular thing, when you're not just using it for a few things, it's still not quite as good as you might like. So some challenges there. Amazon is going to swipe everything before it, but there are still opportunities for people who can really make things simple and easy. And sometimes Amazon just offers too much choice and too many dodgy recommendations is a problem for all online shopping uh, that we've seen also becoming a problem during 2020 as it just explodes. Other things we can see, climate change. Uh, before lockdown, 78% of people said we were heading for disaster unless we change our habits. It's now 83%. And, it's, and that growth we've seen everywhere. So people want the government to build back, but in a green way. And showing what you're doing about that will be very important. People will, of course, not necessarily want to pay more for green products. But I think Britain is a brilliant example of how you can make big changes without necessarily um, even having to ask the public, actually. So we're one of the leading producers of renewables out of the largest economies in the world. As a percentage of our uh, energy consumption and production, more of it is green from wind power, et cetera, uh, than pretty much any other major uh, Western economy. And we've done that without asking anybody. We've simply charged consumers a bit more. We changed some tax rules. We pushed a little bit and we've achieved that in terms of all of those wind farms that we've produced. So, you know, similarly, London has a congestion charge uh, and the man who introduced it against public opinion, Ken Livingston, um, he did some good things. He, we have it in here. We don't have it in Manchester or Stockholm. The reason we have it is we did not have a referendum. We just did it. And he actually got re-elected after doing it. So perhaps there are some changes that we can make that people will actually accept and that will lead us to better outcomes. Other things we can see. Will eventually all diseases be curable? The British seem to be getting, if anything, more optimistic. Uh, so we'll see. We haven't become more pessimistic about science during lockdown. So that's good. Uh, on the other hand, um, there are some challenges. I think all vaccines are beneficial for me and my family. We've still got three quarters of us who say that they are, but it's down from 80 and 16% of people in Britain, very roughly, think that uh, the virus might be some kind of hoax or not really dangerous. Uh, and, uh, you know, when they're told to take a vaccine about something they, they're not convinced about, they think it's a bit of a hoax, they're QAnon fans, uh, there you have it. Uh, there are going to be some challenges vaccinating everybody in the West. But at the same time, of course, I think it's important to say that not everything changes. So here you are, 1999 to 2020. I wish I could slow my life down. We're all spending so much time on these calls, back to back calls, one after the other, with no time to think. And the commuting time that we used to have that allowed us to sort of switch off or just reflect or listen to music, it's gone. We wake up, we brush our teeth. And then if you're like me, you start thinking about work. And but actually, interestingly, we need to keep a sense of perspective. And overall, really, it's, it's around half of us, but it was around half of us 20 years ago before Zoom calls were even imagined. And interestingly, you know, when you look at something like online privacy, loads of us will say we're worried about online privacy today. But if I was to show you the trend on that back to the 1990s, 
It would also show that in the 1990s, we weren't worried about online privacy, but we were worried about data privacy and who had our data anyway. So some things don't change anywhere near as much as we might think. And finally, I'll just say, therefore, uh, you know, we need to be careful then about being clear about what is going to stick and what is not going to stick. If I can move forward, great. Um, you know, there are some, there are some start, we're starting to see changes in our values. We've seen massive changes in our behaviours. Uh, we can, you know, it's very likely that 20% of people who used to go and work at an office five days a week will no longer do so. They, it's been proven that they don't need to and their lives have definitely improved. Uh, other people like me um, will probably go in maybe for two or three days a week. But again, you know, we don't know if the virus disappears. We needed those offices for something. They were places for training. They were places for building a culture at work. And how we change uh, the way we do things is, is really hard. We can flip overnight to online working. But actually, all of those other changes take time to move forward. I mean, you know, printing. Was only invent, was invented in 1450, so a long time ago. But it, in the in the Middle Ages or the Renaissance, it took a hundred years for the total impact of printing to become apparent in terms of how it was going to change Europe. What we saw was a massive, and sadly, in this case, a massive increase in violence. There were religious wars, millions of people died because they found that other people had been lying to them about what the Bible really said when they got their hands on it. The online world that didn't exist 20 years ago is only in its infancy. And so we need to be careful about what's going to happen, but undoubtedly we'll, we'll need to be adaptable. And I think if I can, we can see signs, as we say here, on brands, in health and in online behaviours. But the thing that comes out of all of this most strongly to me is that it is not the strongest, and it's not even the, it's not the biggest organisations always. It's not even the cleverest people that will do best out of this crisis. But ultimately, it will be the most adaptable people, as Darwin said in The Origin of the Species. And it's that, I think, that we need to reflect on as we go forward into you know an unknown period a very uncertain i think 2020s um, as we go as we go forward because we don't know uh, we just don't know uh, what the 2020s will be like there will be some challenges but it will be the most adaptable of us and thank you so much for for bearing with me with the technology uh, and um, any questions thoughts somebody must think this is rubbish but i hope you found that interesting thank you ben thank you that was unbelievable for someone who has an incredibly small brain, like myself, uh, that, was, uh, that was almost too much to take, but I was just hanging on by my fingernails. But our audience, thank God, uh, are made of sterner stuff. And they, they've got some questions that they've been sending through to the app. So I'm going to try and get through as many as I can um, in about 10 minutes here. So the first one, th th there's, there's quite a bit of COVID stuff, as you, as you yeah, probably of imagine. You, you know, we kind of expected it. Um, first one, it would be interesting to know and understand if we did develop a vaccine, would businesses and customers go back to pre-COVID normal completely? That's the first part of this question. Yep. The okay. second part is, if they don't, what are the things that are most likely to have changed for good? Okay, so I think... That where, where you could see an existing trend like e-commerce or like remote working and, or like flexible working and that, that gets exaggerated or amplified by the crisis, it's those things to me that are most likely to stick. So people were already working more flexibly. Business was changing its style. You know, one of the things that my, my colleagues at Unilever had remarked to me that deodorant sales had been falling in Britain because it only takes people to stay at home one day a week and they don't, we don't spruce ourselves up oh, no. uh, quite the same way when we, stay, when we work at home uh, no. as when we work in an office. And uh, as a result of that, we can, so we can certainly see more remote working, uh, less commuting, more online. Those things, I think, are likely to stick. And that has implications for retail markets. It has implications for the housing market and a more potentially a more distributed country that isn't all about London. Ben, I, there's a part of me that was disappointed with the deodorant part of the answer. I didn't want to hear that, but, but hey, listen, the data's the data. All right, so another COVID one. On the subject of a vaccine, do you have global figures available showing how many people would refuse one? We Is do, it, yes. Can I, we just, do have that. Excellent, excellent. 
Is that a cause for concern in terms of eventually defeating it? Yes. I mean, it, it, there are some countries where it's as high as 40 percent. So the first thing is that to give the world the vaccine is 8,000 jumbo jets full to brimming, transport jumbo jets full to brimming with stuff. So first of all, you've got to get those 8,000 jumbo jets around the world and then distribute the actual vaccine. Then you've got to persuade the populations to actually take the vaccine. So the bottom line with COVID-19 is particularly as it doesn't seem to grant when you get even when you recover, it doesn't grant you immunity that it's going to be several years before we have complete immunity to this disease is dealt with, it would look like at the moment. And that means that all of the summer, many of these social distancing measures, even if we go back to being allowed to meet each other, going to restaurants and pubs, those measures, a lot of those are actually going to have to stay, unfortunately. So, and I think that will, of course, mean that some of these trends about how we run our businesses and how much remote working and sadly conferences like this, rather because it would be much, it's lovely to see you all, but it'd be even better if we were actually in a room together. Mm -hmm. I think some of that, those implications are going to actually, you have to assume that some of those things will be there for longer. British Airways saying they don't think air travel will return to its 2019 levels to 2023, 2024. And some people saying, we just will stop doing a lot of that business travel for a two hour meeting, which you didn't even really need to do. And now you can you just don't need it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to move it off off COVID for a little bit. Talk a little bit more about about the business that, you, that, that you're the CEO of. A um, couple of questions on kind of how do you actually ensure that your data is kind of wholly representative of, of, of the sure. population. You know, what, what sort of questions do you, how, how do you, how do you get this stuff basically? Okay, well, so, I mean, you'll have, for those of you who doubt the accuracy of opinion polls, the, um, the, the poll that we did in the run up to the general election last year predicted within 0.3% accuracy, the average um, actual result for each of the political parties in Britain. But the way it works is achieving, it's a bit like achieving a random sample. Achieving a sample is like, tasting a bowl of soup. You get a bowl of soup, you stir it well, have a tiny sip, and you can then predict what the whole bowl of soup tastes like. So what we have to do is make sure that the people we select for interviews are representative of Britain. And so whether we do that door to door, and I still actually have to this day, because I'm working for, on behalf of the government at the moment doing random COVID testing, people turning up at people's addresses all over the UK, can take, we're carrying a COVID test and we ask you, we turn up and say, would you mind just doing a COVID test right now? Um, and the way, the way, you know, so the way sampling works is you choose a random 1,000 addresses or 2,000 addresses. And literally, in the case of face-to-face -face interviewing, which we still do, and it's good for the, there's still 10% of people who are not online. We literally come to your house. If you're out, we come back another time. If you say no, we send back somebody of a different gender with a smiling face, and we see if that persuades you to do it. Unless you say no with vigor, and we, we pester you, and in the end, we can get a representative sample. With random telephone surveys, it's the same. We dial, we generate numbers at random in each area of the UK, including mobile numbers, and we make sure that we've got the right balance of men, women, black people, white people, people in Devon versus people in Scotland, uh, young people versus old people. If you get the right profile, you can be pretty sure, uh, all other things being considered, that you will have a reasonably, the sample should be reasonably robust. And I, I always find that astonishing. You know, I've done this job for 33 years. A thousand people carefully chosen inside London, or a thousand people carefully chosen inside Britain, or a thousand people carefully chosen inside America, mm -hmm. or a thousand people carefully chosen across the entire planet, as long as they're randomly re chosen to be representative of the population, each of those samples of a thousand for the planet or London or my borough where I'm sitting now, Lambeth, in each case, it would be accurate to plus or minus 3% um, 95 times out of 100. If it were possible to interview every sentient being in the, in the, in the universe, and I chose a thousand sentient beings in the entire universe, as long as they were chosen at random, uh, my, my data would be accurate to plus or minus 3%. That is the law of statistics. You got me, Ben. I'll, I'll admit it. You got me. Okay, I think we've got about three or four minutes. I'm going to try and get one more and we might get two. We're going to go... Back I'll be to, quick, sorry. Back to the COVID. No, no, please don't. No, no, it's unbelievably good stuff. What were the qualities or actions that businesses or individuals in previous recessions and previous economic crises demonstrated that has helped them overcome the damage suffered during that crisis. 
Is there anything that we can take from those experiences that might help us in the crisis that we're in? Well, I mean, I think all, all crises are, it's a bit, Tolstoy said that all families are miserable in different ways. And sadly, all crises are miserable in different ways. But clearly, and I, I, I managing your P&L and being, being conscious of your costs, sadly, this basic stuff, you know, the reason most businesses go bust is cash flow. Mm. So sadly, the basic 101 stuff matters. And I think the, the key issue here, and I see this in many of the businesses I'm responsible for, you know, assuming that something will turn up and that things will get better is generally a route for disaster. So if you've got a challenge, you, you know, co furlough is pretty much over now. Uh, you need to you need to embrace it. At the same time, I think it's interesting how in the 2008 recession, unlike some of the ones I saw when I was growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, we kept more people in employment. We didn't have the same level of unemployment. Now, whether that's going to be true this autumn, will people not take pay rises? Will people accept uh, you know, part-time working in order to keep colleagues at work. And we turned out the last recession to be much more flexible about that. And that, that in some ways protected people. It didn't, it, it had, it did put a big squeeze on, on real wages, but it did mean that we didn't have an unemployment crisis. Uh, so I, maybe we'll see that sort of flexibility. We've already got that in terms of how we're working now. So can we possibly see that? And then the other thing, finally, if you're running a business, I think many of you will have experienced this. You know, people want visible leadership. They want consistency. And they actually want you to tell the truth. Not necessarily with a, you know, so brutally you're giving it them with both barrels, but they want to know the truth and they want, they want that transparency. And we've seen political leaders in the crisis who've managed to be consistent, honest, and open with people and communicate clearly and consistently. We've seen their ratings soar. So people like Angela Merkel, uh, Jacinda, Jacinda, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, Conte in Italy, and Mr. Trump and Mr. Johnson didn't do quite so well on that. But the same thing applies in business, quite frankly. Okay, Ben, I'm gonna, j j just one more, if you don't mind, just in, in, sure. in the kind of two minutes that we've got. Having, having held this position at Ipsos Mori for a little while, do, do, are you kind of like sort of immune to being surprised by some of the data that you receive? Do you ever have stuff that comes in and you think, what, really? Does no, of that course. Still we, well, I tweeted, I tweeted about one the other day. So right. most of the time, if, you're, if you understand the British public, then you sort of know what, you know, how they tend to react to things. But I think the, the thing that this week was shock was not was a big surprise was the fact that Scotland appears to have swung decisively in favour of independence. So mm. it's been going up gently. It's been around 50 percent. But we did a poll recently and the results came in. I asked them to go and double check absolutely everything because I was like, oh, my gosh, because if it's true, it means 58 percent of Scots want to leave uh, the UK. They have fed up over Brexit. They don't like Boris Johnson. Only 14 percent are happy with Boris Johnson. Seventy two percent like Nicola Sturgeon. Um, and they're fed up about Brexit uh, and and the handling of Covid, which they think is better in Scotland than it is in London. And therefore, they're, they're off ski. Now, if that happens, that's, that makes COVID seem like a small walk in the park. And how, you know, when, when they're going to get their referendum, are you going to start seeing the sort of you know, issues that we've got Barcelona has uh, against Madrid in Spain? We don't know. But I, that was the thing that surprised me most recently. Ben, listen, um, we, we are sadly out of time. Um, we, we could have done about another hour here. Um, I wanted to thank you very much for, for rattling through that for us this morning. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, maybe we'll get you back on in a couple of months' time and, and see where we are in terms of some other public opinions. But for sure. now, have a great weekend, Ben. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Wonderful. Bye -bye. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm glad to say that uh, what's happening is people are now sending messages to me over the app to inform me that they are wearing deodorant and uh, one lady in particular has told me what perfume she's wearing, so it uh, could be a big night for me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for the mighty, mighty Ben Page. And thank you to you for those amazing questions. We were almost overwhelmed. Not quite, but almost. Please keep them coming for our next guest, who has the most extraordinary CV. To keep this as simple as we can, for us mere mortals, I'll start with where he is now on our work back. So he's currently the executive director and head of the environmental, social and governance consultancy at Edelman. He's a solicitor, he's a former corporate employment lawyer, and he served in parliament for nine years, including as the shadow business secretary. 
We are absolutely knocked out that he's joining us on BidX today. A genuine honour to welcome Chucka Amuna. Chucka, thank you for being with us. How are you, sir? Very good, Pete. Good to be with everyone. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Well, listen, I'm going to make, and our audience is going to make the most of this opportunity, but by increasing the Q&A time that we have with you at the end, people of APMP, please keep those questions and comments flying in. For the meantime, though, Chucker, I'm going to hand it over to you. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Well, look, thank you so much to APMP UK for inviting me to speak to your members today. Um, I've been asked to talk about the topic of evolution, and I couldn't think, to be frank, of a more apt topic given the extraordinary times that we've all been living through in business and professionally this year. Um, personally, I've been through an evolution of sorts. I completed a decade as a member of the UK Parliament at the end of last year. Um, I was never going to be a lifer in the House of Commons. I had always wanted to return to the private sector. Um, and I suppose the, the backstop, if I'm to use the kind of Brexitism, was to exit before my children became aware of what I did as a job and before it really started to impact on them very directly and they became aware of their friends parents talking about me etc so i always intended to leave the stage i suppose before they got to that age and ultimately i suppose the electors were the ones who determined the exact timing um i knew after a decade right at the heart um, of the political action in this country that um it would be an adjustment and i was going to have to evolve myself um, my mates had always written me about becoming a reality TV star post-politics and um, sure enough, an approach from I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, did arrive. <laughs> I kid you not. Um, however, tempting as eating um, giant maggots in some far-flung location for the entertainment of millions might be, um, I, I certainly didn't think that was the right path for me. Um, I'd given some thought to what I wanted to do um, a couple of years before I left the House of Commons, actually. Um, and I knew I would be now re-entering the private sector with just under, I suppose, a decade under my belt as a corporate employment law solicitor, as Pete referred to. And then I had obviously a decade in the House of Commons uh, where I carried out various senior roles from the opposition benches leading on public policy on the role of business and in how the interests of all stakeholders, yes, shareholders, but also those of employees, customers, clients, suppliers, local communities, the environment can all be brought into play too. So consequently, my role now, my principal role now is as executive director and head of ESG at Edelman, which is the world's biggest strategy and communications advisory firm for those who haven't come across us. I co-lead our global strategic consultancy that provides advice to corporates um, and investors on how to integrate environmental, social and governance factors into decision making. I'm based out of the firm's um, specialist capitalist uh, capital markets and financial services team in London. And I've got particular responsibility for the um, ESG practice across Europe, um, the Middle East and Africa. Um, I also work across the wider corporate affairs division on a whole suite of issues for clients. So therefore, like so many of you watching, um, the process of winning business through proposals, bids, tenders and presentations is very much at the core of what I now do. In fact, I was doing a, uh, a bid, a presentation of sorts to a prospective client not long before I came to speak to you. In addition, I also serve as a non-executive director on the board of Advanced, which is the UK's third largest software company. And I've got uh, two other non-executive roles with um, a smaller tech company. So I've been pretty busy. Now, um, I tell you this because it's this experience that informs all of the suggestions that I'm gonna be making to you today. And I say suggestions because I'm conscious that everyone's got their own story. I'm acutely aware of the diversity of sectors amongst those in this audience who are carrying out varied business functions and joining, frankly, from different countries um, from all over the world, which are in diff at different points in dealing with what we're going through. Um, included in this experience, therefore, is there's a lot of change for me, but nothing could have prepared all of us for the change we've all experienced this year and how we would have to 
adapt and evolve in the light of the pandemic. It's worth, I think, when we consider all of this, um, taking a step back and considering all the transformation that had occurred before the pandemic um, had even hit. Um, and just think back to 2015, five years ago, who would have thought that by 2020, here in the UK, for example, an obscure backbencher called Jeremy Corbyn would have come and gone after five unconventional years, if we describe it as that, as the leader of the opposition. Um, who would have thought that the UK would no longer be a member of the European Union? So, you know, we now no longer will be using going forward uh, the burgundy red passports with that European Union on the top. We're now gone back to the old black ones um, that were issued when, when I, well, when, when, when my parents um, were around before I came about. Who would have thought that an outspoken reality TV star from the US version of The Apprentice would be the current resident of the White House now vying for a second term as president of the United States? And who would have thought that a former presenter of the satirical BBC chat show, How I Got News For You, would now be luxuriating in number 10 Downing Street as a UK Prime Minister at this time too, five years ago? Who would have thought this? And then consider <laughs> that all of these guys get knocked sideways by a global pandemic that comes out of nowhere and has led to most of the world through a large part of this year being shut down um, with both aforementioned world leaders being affected by the virus themselves with the UK Prime Minister almost being killed by it. Now, five years ago, if someone put all of this to you, you would have considered this to be fiction or, or perhaps at least a pretty decent horror film, not the reality. Um, but this is what we've been living through. And of course, I haven't cited the worst of it because worse still, not only has it made doing business for all of you extremely challenging, but tragically, we have seen over 40,000 COVID deaths in the UK alone, over 1 million worldwide. That's the human tragedy here. In the mix, this year, we also had the appalling murder of an innocent black man, George Floyd, in the United States, which shone a light on the ongoing race inequalities in this world, which again has had a huge impact like we haven't seen before. So how do you make sense of all of this? How do we adapt? In the next 10 to 15 minutes, um, I intend to take stock of the business environment, the landscape that we're all operating in, think about how this has affected our collective psychology, psyche, um, explore how we adapt to this new reality, and then take a look to the future. Um, the approach I suggest that we adopt and then finally outline the, the kind of elements of a action plan, a battle plan, all of which I hope will be applicable to different business people in different sectors listening from all over the world today. It goes without saying the starting point is surely that we should all be incredibly grateful simply to be alive um, and grateful that those of our loved ones who are still with us are here safe and hopefully well. Um, we feel this acutely in my family because not only was there the change of job and as which I mentioned earlier, but my second daughter arrived into this world 10 days before the first lockdown. And we were terrified at the challenge the virus would pose for a newborn. And there simply wasn't enough data then telling us how she would be able to get through it. So the business environment, clearly it has been an incredibly challenging one. Um, COVID-19 has had far reaching effects or on, a, on our economies. Um, although it's expected that, for example, across the Eurozone, half the decline in output seen in the first half of this year will be reversed during the third quarter, economies are still operating far below pre-pandemic levels. The increase in infection rates now is causing havoc for sectors that were already heavily impacted by social distancing. Uh, some state support to business is being rolled back uh, and unemployment here in the UK on average is forecast to hit 8% in this quarter, causing households to save and not spend. Uh, as a result, we're seeing some of the biggest names already either going under or at least 
permanently shutting stores with mass job losses. This has had a profound effect on the national psyche in this country, and I'm sure it's the case in other countries in a way that can't be underestimated. Um, Globalisation, and I dealt a lot with this issue and its impact um, during my time in politics has caused a lot of strides forward, has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in developing um, countries and third world countries across the world, but it had already created a huge amount of insecurity. As a result of the pandemic, the world has become more uncertain still, a more uncertain place still. And this has affected the role people expect businesses and brands to play. Some businesses, some have been able to get ahead, leveraging their logistical capabilities and marketing spend to project clarity, continuity, uh, and fairness in the way that they treat their partners and their stakeholders. Uh, also providing, I think, emotional connection when, particularly when we can't go out or restricted uh, at a time of isolation. People have been hungry for authoritative sources of information with 70% of people globally checking the news at least once a day, seeking out reliable information, information and clear guidance at the height of the pandemic. Uh, we've all been news junkies at some point during this year. I suppose before becoming too depressed to keep watching a lot of it. Um, and those businesses that have gone a step beyond, uh, you know, from making significant uh, donations to turning over production capabilities to addressing immediate needs like PPE, that's been recognized. But those that have failed to step up or misstepped have been cast in a harsh light. And that's whether it was misjudged communications on social media, uh, media or through not being in control of their story in the mainstream media, numerous brands were criticised, in some cases, despite trying to, to help. And, and one thing that we found at Edelman, actually, is that the consumer and the public has become really very activist on this. Um, when we asked people in March, April last of, of this year, sorry, um, about some of these issues, a third of the respondents, for example, said that they had actively dissuaded people they know from buying products from a business because of the perception that that business hadn't been doing the right thing in the pandemic. So how do we manage delivery, uh, reputation in this context? How do you engage in this context? Um, what changes in cadence, frequency, content and tone are needed as we seek to communicate and continue to do business in the midst of this ongoing pandemic? At a time of crisis, people, both internal and external, want uh, communications and messages that allay their concerns about their material and social needs and their worries, actually, their worries. And when people feel fragile, as they do now, we have to understand that anticipating and responding to these expectations and the way people feel um, is essential. And this isn't easy because there are so many relationships for all of us to manage, be it with your staff, your clients, customers, um, your suppliers, uh, community stakeholders that you, you, you have to deal with. Um, so at times like this, communicating with a clear intent and purpose is vital. Simplicity and clarity of message have never been so important. And actually, the government illustrates this well, because at the beginning of this year, at the outset of the uh, pandemic, the UK government prosecuted perhaps one of the most effective communications campaigns we've ever seen from a government at the start of the pandemic. And it's, uh, it's completely lost its way recently, obviously, on that front. Um, so we're all going to have to leverage uh, customer relationships, marketing spend to demonstrate the steps that we are taking um, to protect them, to protect other stakeholders, stakeholders and point people towards the authoritative information that they crave. And uh, we've been advising clients on this very much um, over the last few months. Now, as Ben was saying, actually, although predictions about what will change are not certain, I do think that businesses, firms, brands, we've all got to look to the future now and prepare for how, um, how to recover. 
Um, now we don't know everything, but what we I think know and what's increasingly clear is that even if we get a vaccine, and uh, I might say a bit of a, a bit more about that in a bit, things are unlikely to return to normal. Um, so working patterns and places of work uh, are not going to be the same. Uh, I don't believe we'll go back to the strict nine to five, if you're lucky to have had nine to five, <laughs> um, Monday to Friday way of working. I just don't believe that we're going to go back to that. I don't think there will be the same expectation or can be the same expectation on the part of employers that you do everything in the office um, in the way that there was before this pandemic even if we get a vaccine. Um, digital acceleration, uh, you know, the amount of digital acceleration we would have expected to see over five years, we've actually seen take place in around five months. Uh, that's not going to be reversed. Unfortunately, there's quite likely to be a whole, a whole cohort of employees out of work who are gonna need to be reskilled, particularly for the digital age we definitely are in now. Um, there's gonna be a mountain of public sector debt that's gonna to have to be dealt with. How do we pay for that? Who will pay the taxes? Um, we're gonna to want to put more money at the same time into healthcare provision. Um, and I, I suppose, what's the shape of globalization gonna be? Are we gonna travel as much for leisure or business? So look, this is all gonna happen and it does mean that we're not going to go back to the same world. So as life changes for people, um, business and br businesses and brands are obviously going to need to change um, two. And we're all going to need to plan uh, and engage now in order, as we hopefully get into a growth, a regrowth recovery period, in order to regrow faster, better, and ensure that we as businesses remain trusted, we remain relevant and successful throughout these turbulent times. And, and let me just get into how uh, what, perhaps the approach what we're dealing with and, and, and a plan. Um, at Edelman, we've been studying what drives trust in business for the best part of two decades now. Um, and from all that research and our learning, we deduce, I suppose, four key imperatives in the approach you, you adopt to respond to this crisis moving forward. The first is show up and do your part. Um, there's no doubt about it. Business has got an absolute vital role to play here. So now is not the time to disappear but to be present, use all your resources and cre creativity to make a difference. And I do appreciate in saying that, that in some cases, this is just not gonna be possible. Maybe you've had to shut your business down altogether. Maybe it's been impossible to do business, although you may have considered, continued as a going concern given all the social distancing measures and restrictions. But in many cases, people have managed to uh, soldier on. Secondly, don't always act alone. Um, there's a strength in collaboration and to truly help people during this crisis does require joining forces with others, perhaps some of your competitors uh, and also working with government. Um, and I know of just a, a friend of mine who, who runs a really thriving, innovative uh, wedding uh, business, uh, wedding planning business. They've actually just started up a new association for lots of others operating that space, including their competitors, so that they can collectively deal with some of the issues. Um, that sector, and we know how with social distancing, you know, first you could have a wedding with 30, I can't remember where we've got to now, but lots of challenges there, seeking to do that together. Third, um, focus a lot of effort on finding appropriate and meaning solutions to the problems that people are facing today. And I, I know this is kind of stating the the obvious, but I, I think it bears repeating. Is there anything you do now um, that could be repurposed to address people's needs now? So doing business similarly to the way you did it before, but in a different way um, that addresses things that have particularly changed or challenges created by the pandemic. And I actually see, I mean, all the businesses that I've been involved with, Edelman and, all, and the ones that on, on the boards of which I sit, have a lot of focus has been on that. Um, and above all, I think, communicate with emotion, do it with compassion and the facts. I think at times like this, people are reassured by positive brand actions and commitments. So, and, and, and communicate with empathy. I think sometimes we can be too clinical in the way that we describe things. And, you know, there's a comfort in using numbers and percentages, et cetera. Break it down for people. 
So what is hopefully on the horizon in the months to come? If that's the, the approach, what are the likely elements of the journey to recovery? I think core to this, and, and, and Ben touched on this, is going to be finding a vaccine. And one of the most alarming things actually in the research that we've seen is it's not necessarily a given that people are going to um, take up the vaccine. And we've seen an alarming resistance in, in some markets to a vaccine, which I cannot fathom, but is unfortunately there. But obviously, uh, mass immunisation is going to be a hugely important part of the return to good health uh, and a health recovery um, where health systems can return to near normal. Um, uh, and death rates and in new infections are significantly reduced. Uh, now, uh, on the timing of the vaccine, it seems from the people I speak to in the life science sector that we are probably looking at if, you know, hopefully having a functional vaccine around the beginning of next year. Um, the priority will probably be health workers and the most vulnerable in terms of getting jabs. Um, and in, uh, in terms of mass immunization, uh, uh, late summer, sorry, early, su early, late spring, early summer looks to be the, um, the forecast. This in turn will hopefully lead to societal recovery with people able and willing to engage with the world beyond COVID-19. Um, whether through reduced restrictions as we go down this path or other social and technological means. And then there can be that business recovery that we all want to see, um, where you can return to work with fewer barriers to trade and easing of restrictions, uh, or at least an ability to mitigate the effect of the restrictions. Um, and there will be a need to respond to all three parts of that health recovery, societal recovery, and business recovery, um, and to get the timing right and to judge when best to intervene, do things and act. And that's where I think an action plan and, and having an outline of an action plan now um, is important. And I, I would dis distill this into three parts. The first is define a valuable role in this context for your business or whatever it is, whatever organization it is that you're part of. Um, understand the right way at the right time and in the right place when to act and how to express what you're doing and what's appropriate given what's going on. Um, and what is the valuable place for the, your business to be active? Um, and not just for you to do your business, but for your customers, for your employees, for the stakeholders. Um, how are the commercial priorities and messages incorporated within that? So that's going to involve looking at how your business is able to operate, what restrictions are in place, considering how you can mitigate or overcome them. And if you've been closed, looking at how you can reintroduce yourself to the various audiences that are essential to you being able to operate. The second part, I think, is then an act, you know, having a program of activity and communication which adds value and builds trust amongst your internal and external stakeholders. Uh, and in this, I think you've got to connect your values to commercial needs um, and your this way ensure relevance and appropriateness for internal and external stakeholders. So test your messaging with trusted audiences before you go out and do this. Um, engage your employees, talk to your supply chain to establish what is possible and desirable. Obviously don't presume that is the worst. Um, and explain why actions are taken, but also why they might not be taken in a transparent manner. Um, I, I don't think you can over communicate, frankly, um, in this situation. The third thing is, um, as the situation evolves, be prepared to listen and to respond in real time to what's going on. Uh, there will need to be constant horizon scanning, a constant consideration of the medical and health crisis, uh, a constant appreciation, obviously, of the economic fallout that you are going to feel. Um, and the social fallout. And this is going to be constantly changing and evolving. So you've got to make sure your fingers are on the pulse with that. Um, and, and unfortunately, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want to have to read the news because a lot of it is not good news. But unfortunately, you need to be on the money and know what's going on. Um, and also, I think we're all able and we'll be able to learn from global experiences and learnings from those regions and economies that are moving into the recovery phase before us and are further down the line um, and see what they are doing and see the best practice. Um, and I think you've got to think how resonant your action and leadership is for your communities, for your stakeholders and societies, 
how and how do does what you're thinking of, of doing compare to your peers and best practice? I kind of feel I'm beginning to reinforce the stereotype of a, a boring politician who drones on too long. So let me finish by saying this. Um, I'm a progressive uh, and I'm naturally an optimist, but I don't think I'm being naive in saying that I think we're going to get through this. I really do. Human ingenuity, creativity and genius, I believe, is going to lead to the medical advances necessary to get that vaccine. I do believe it's going to happen. And I think that same ingenuity, imagination and vim um, We'll see to it over time that our businesses recover too. Um, the world is going to be different uh, and that will be a challenge for all of us, be it business or government. But I think our, our mission's got to be to make sure that the world on the other side of this is better than the one we left behind. Um, we all want to make money and do well, but fundamentally, I think we all want to live in a good society and make a positive impact. So I hope what I've said today has at least given some pointers on how you might do that in the short to medium term. Thanks very much for listening. And with that, I'll pass back over to Pete. Chucker, thank you for that. That was, that was immense. I thought it was gonna be immense and it was. And due to its immenseness, there has <laughs> been a run of questions um, on our app. So I'm, I'm gonna jump straight in um, with a few of these. We've got about, got about 15 minutes or so. Um, Great stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with, uh, with the kind of sort of e ESR, CSR. Um, um, area, which is obviously where you're spending your time now at Edelman. This is, this is a bit of a tricky one, but I, I'd be interested in your, in your view on this. Are businesses faking their ESR, CSR efforts for a little bit of PR, or are they really making noticeable changes? What's your view on that? Uh, well, that's a big question. Of course, the, you know, when we talk about businesses, we've got 5 million businesses in this country. Mm. The majority are actually small and medium-sized businesses. Um, but obviously the ones that often command the most attention are large ones. I, I, I honestly don't think that businesses in the main are faking it. Okay. Um, my observation is that people know that environmental, social and governance factors take, and taking account of all stakeholders matters more than ever before. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to believe that that was because suddenly there's kind of been some Damascene um, epiphany uh, the, the belief that shareholder, uh, shareholder primacy, just focusing on that is, is old hat and we've got to think about um, stakeholders. But the real thing that, simply with the large companies that was driving this even before the pandemic, was the, the changing nature of investors and the demography change. And the millennial investor in particular, right. um, inheriting a lot of money from baby boomers, but also earning substantial sums themselves. And the younger um, cohorts are basically saying, yes, I want a good return for my investments. I want value, but I want my values to be re reflected in that. And so it's actually the market that is demanding action. And so businesses are responding to this because if they don't do the right thing on this and they try and fake it, then they are not going to get the investment mm. um, that is needed for them to be able to thrive. So I, I, I don't think, I mean, I'm generalizing here. It was a general question. I don't think on balance that most businesses are faking it. Some are, but they will get found out and there will be quite severe repercussions, um, I think, in terms of you'll have an ESG controversy and then you'll have a flight of, of, of capital out of your business. Um, so uh, that's the answer I give to that one. Okay, cool. Um, I've got one here, which is a little bit of a continuation on this. Can you please ask Chucker what he thinks of the forthcoming EU regulations on ESG and sustainability and what else can be done to support better measurement and reporting? Well, I actually think so. The, the EU taxonomy is a new regulation that is coming into effect in tranches um, and will be fully in effect by in, in or by um, 2022. And what it does it's basically a labelling and classification system um, which sets out the criteria you need to meet in order to describe yourself, uh, your business activity as green or sustainable. So I think this is a really big step in the right direction because for those who want to be sure that a company, if it's saying it's sustainable, really is, or an investment product is going to be going into sustainable purposes, um, they are going, you know, the companies and investors are going to have to comply with this framework, mm -hmm. which should hopefully prevent the faking it, um, greenwashing, if you, if you like. And it will apply to companies 
with over 500 employees. And it will apply to pretty much most of the large investment houses too. Now, the interesting thing, people might say, well, you know, particularly in the UK context, how is this still relevant? We're not in the EU anymore. Well, of course, all of our companies and our investment houses are going to want to sell into the EU. And if you're selling products into the EU, you're going to have to comply with the taxonomy too. So I think that's really good. And I think ultimately, you do need public policymakers to lead on setting these global standards and frameworks for the classification of um, ESG and, and to you know, govern the disclosure of information from companies as to what they're doing and, and their impact. And really, I mean, everyone wants to be a hero in this area. There's all different organizations coming up with standards and frameworks. Um, and some of them are commercial and therefore not independent. So I think policymakers that are elected and have a mandate are the clear people to take lead on this. They're doing that in the EU. And I do believe if we see a change in administration in the US, particularly if you have a change in the White House, in addition to a change in control of the Senate so that the Senate would become Democrat too, I think we'll see some change in the states also. Okay, that's awesome. Listen, while you were, um, while you were presenting to us, I was looking at the, uh, at the kind of social wall bit on the app, and there, there's a lot of talk around what's needed when we listen to Chuck, and what's going to be needed from businesses is agility and flexibility. And th th there's a, a cool question on that, which I wanted to ask you, which is, given the impact that there has been on big corporate organisations as we come out of the pandemic, whenever that is, is it now the time for small, medium enterprises to excel because they've got the ability to be more flexible and agile and they'll adapt to whatever this new landscape is going to look like. What's your view on that? I think there's a big opportunity. Um, I know a really exciting, innovative company in the event space. Right. Uh, uh, it's not a startup anymore. It's been going on. It's been going for a few years, probably making the transition from being a small to a medium sized company. And it has competitors on the field also um, providing solutions in the event space that are far bigger than them, but also um, were much more highly leveraged before they went into this pandemic. And the result has been actually that the big boys who dominated that space are beginning to fall by the wayside going into administration. But this particular events company that I know well is actually managed to raise sufficient funds to give it plenty of runway into a post-vaccine world. And so I just think you do have that agility and ability to adapt because you're not this colossus. And, you know, I find sometimes with some large companies, it kind of reminds me of dealing with government just because of the scale of the, the operations when you've got literally hundreds of thousands of employees. But if you're smaller, you can you can adapt uh, more quickly. Um, you have less, you know, you often sometimes don't have the same leverage issues. You're not. Uh, you, you don't have the same overheads. So I think um, this, this, you know, on the one hand, I think it's incredibly difficult because you don't have a giant balance sheet. Um, but on the other hand, I think you can be more agile in this kind, kind of environment. So I think there's, there's, lots, of, there's lots of benefits. Fantastic. Um, let, let, let's keep on the kind of sort of business economic theme at the moment. Um, bit of a direct one, but I think we've got to call it out. H how exactly are the government going to cope with what's about to come, which is a, a fairly serious amount of debt, apart from increasing taxes? I think on, on the whole, probably taxes are going to have to go up. Um, I think there is a greater acceptance in the markets of the need for governments to borrow mm. in the short to medium term. Um, I would be surprised if uh, there is a, a, you know, a reversion back to a kind of austerity uh, and a feeling in the market that um, you've got to enter into fiscal consolidation at speed without a consideration or enough of a consideration for the um, knock-on impact on demand. So I think, I think the, the attitude towards government borrowing is, is, is somewhat different. Um, but they will want to see a plan to pay down deficits and debt, and that is inevitably going to involve tax increases. Um, and that's when the rubble will hit the road for all of us, because it's all very well here in the UK every Thursday during lockdown, we were all going out on our doorsteps and clapping the NHS. Mm. Um, now, when a lot of people will have lost their jobs or had salary cuts, how prepared are they going to be to 
pay the increase in income tax, which I believe ultimately is going to be necessary to properly fund our national health service. Mm. And, you know, you can clap when you're in the voting booth and you're potentially find, finding yourself facing an increase in income tax when you already feel that you've been through financially straightened times. Maybe you've been a two owner firm family that's a one owner one now. How prepared are you going to be doing that to, to, to do that? There's going to be some hard choices on the debt front, by the way. I think it's worth um, remembering and I, 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 an economist here who, who know the history better than me will correct me if I'm wrong. But I think it was only in 2005 in the UK mm. that we actually finished paying off the debt that was incurred since the Second World War. And I think what that says is that you can carry a certain amount of debt for a long period of, uh, of time uh, and run a successful economy. Okay, amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you something um, about leadership. As someone who, who, who is a business leader now, um, and you know, you've obviously you know, been exposed to lots of different types of leadership in your career in politics, is it, is it fair to say that at the moment, regardless of kind of the political leanings of, of, of Johnson and Trump, you know, put that to one side, uh, is this kind of an all-time low for leadership right now? I think historically, um, uh, our leaders at the moment, particularly the populist ones, um, I don't think... Uh, history will be kind to the handling of this crisis. Mm. I think part of the challenges, to be honest, is, and I think this was a problem in any event in normal times, and I think it is just exacerbated in extraordinary times, is that what it takes to get into high office um, and that set of skills isn't necessarily the set of skills which is required to run something effectively. Mm. Um, and I mean, I, I, I'm often struck by the number of senior people in business I speak to who say, you know, I look at the UK House of Commons and I wouldn't inv even invite three quarters of them to an interview. Now, that's not me saying that, that's some business leaders. And I think that's actually sometimes pretty unfair. But I think you've got a mismatch between the skills needed to govern effectively and just get stuff done and, this, and the skills needed to make it politically. Um, and it really worries me um, because certainly in the UK, um, the real question for us is, do we, you know, in an ideal world, I would want the most able leading figures in lots of different fields, medicine, um, the law, the arts, science, finance, you name it. I'd want really weighty, substantial people who are really successful in those fields to give that up for a bit and go into the House of Commons and give us the benefit of their experience and their learning. Mm. And those are the kinds of people you want, really, um, and who also have a particular set of values and an ideology, which I think is important too. But I think you've now got a situation where too few people fit that description and too many are politicos and have just been on the treadmill to become a parliamentary candidate and then become an MP and then want to be an MP for life. And I just don't think that has produced the right cohort we need in terms of people to run our country. And I say that as somebody who's been very up close to it. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned it during my speech, I, I, would ne I never intended to be a lifer in the House of Commons. And yes, I, you know, I left earlier, a little earlier than perhaps I was planning. But I always wanted to go back to the private sector, partly because I suppose during my time in politics, I've come to realise that your capacity to do positive change, and I believe in the power of enterprise, um, actually, I thought in some respects, I was increasing coming to the point of view is greater. You've got a great possibility of doing that in some respects in the private sector, more opportunity to do that in the private sector than um, in politics. Um, but I think it's a really serious issue. Um, but, but let's not pretend that somehow we don't all bear responsibility for that, because to some extent, we get the politicians that we deserve. And um, I, you're not really allowed to say that when you're actually in politics. I can mm -hmm. say it now. And we bear responsibility for that. We bear responsibility for the, you know, it's a tremendous privilege to serve as a member of parliament, but there are a lot of sacrifices in particular that your family have to make, um, never mind death threats and all that type of stuff that we are asking people to put up with. And, and if, if we do want to get the best people from all these other fields, by the way, they are going to, you know, we're requiring them to take a big pay cut. As, at the moment, it's not just a pay cut for them, it's a pay cut for their, for, from their families, albeit that, you know, the average uh, MP salary is far greater than the average. But in a way, we don't want average people I don't, you know, we want ex the problem we've had now, we've had extraordinary times demanding extraordinary people 
and sorry, demanding extraordinary things from very ordinary people. And actually, I just want the best and the most exceptional people running things because then we wouldn't have the, the kind of, you know, look at what's been going on, the utter incompetence we've seen over the last few months to some extent. So I'm probably, I've am probably i probably got myself in loads of hot water saying that, but in a way I can say these things now in a way that I couldn't matter. before. But I think, I think, it's, I think, I think you know, it's a, it's a real, you know, we've got to think about what do we want in our in the people who, who who govern and not just in the UK everywhere. And um, and we have to accept our responsibility. If you don't like the politicians you've got, don't pretend somehow that you don't have a responsibility for, for, for you know, what we've ended up with. Mm. Um, but but I, in spite of everything I just said there, there's some, you know, I think on the whole, I came across people in the House of Commons who had the right intentions, who believed in the national interest and were public spirited and minded people. And it's still a noble occupation in my view, but I do think there needs to be some change. Okay, okay. Listen, we've literally got two minutes left. I'm gonna to try to do something unbelievably ambitious and try and get two questions in two minutes. Okay, so first question. You were talking about your time in politics very briefly there. What do you not miss about being a politician and what do you miss? I, I think uh, I don't miss um, the extent to which it takes you away from your family. And even when you are um, with your family, it's such an all consuming job that you're often not mentally with your family. And so I certainly don't miss that. And I love being able to spend time with my wife and my daughters. It's just been such a revelation really. I and mean, I wasn't able to do that as much um, in politics. I suppose I haven't actually, I feel bad saying this. I haven't really missed it. Um, I had one moment actually um, uh, recently last week, and I won't go into the details of it, but when a, uh, a, a very senior figure in the banking world clearly had been subjected to quite obvious racism. And um, this person is a role model that, you know, many people of color have looked up to all over the world. And even they had clearly been subjected to quite extreme racism in one of the big financial services institutions in the world. And I did want to speak out about that, um, but I couldn't. And I didn't have the same voice I would have done if I, if I was a member of parliament speaking on behalf of 100,000 people, um, because it was just clear injustice to me. And there's lots of things that, I, you know, there's, a, there's other things I've had, you know, a few moments like that, but that's the most recent one I can, I can remember. Um, but I think you also have to have an acute sense of self-awareness and know when you know, your time's up pretty and you need to pass the baton to other people. Um, the one thing I would say to people thinking of doing politics um, is just make sure that you do it for the right reasons and also make sure that you're prepared to leave politics for the sake of what you believe in and your principles. Um, because I took a particular stance on racism towards a minority community, on Brexit and on, you know, might not be prepared to sponsor somebody to be in charge of our economic and national security um, who I didn't think was fit to do the job. And I, I left a political party um, knowing full well that it was most likely I was going to end up leaving politics as a result over that. Mm. But, I, but I do so with a clear conscience and a clear mind. And um, I think if you've got people who are not prepared to do that, you've got a problem with politicians. So, um, but look, I, I, it was a great privilege to serve the constituents in the area that I grew up in and, and I love. Um, but I feel incredibly lucky to have had my time there. And I feel incredibly lucky to be all doing all the, you know, things in business that I'm, I, I'm now doing and really enjoying, and particularly in the current context. And so I think all I want to leave by saying is I wish everybody who's been watching today the very best of luck. I hope mm -hmm. you keep safe and well. I hope you find that route to recovery for your, for your business, but most of all, just for your well-being and your family and whatever community it is that you're hopefully providing lots of jobs in because that's really what this is all about. Chaka, thank you very much. It's a lovely sentiment to end on. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Have a great thank weekend. You. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Good to be with you all. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, what can you say? But wow, Chaka Ramuna there. Hope you all enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Now, before we close, some dates for your diaries, starting with our discussion forums that proved such a big hit last month. There are two of these coming up real soon. The first is this coming Monday, the 19th, and then also next Wednesday, the 21st of October, both forums starting at six o'clock. 
Places are going faster than Boris Johnson's credibility, so please don't delay if you want to be part of that. You can find out how to get involved on our social media channels and also on the app. We have two critical dates for your diaries. Our next BidX episode is going to be coming at you on Friday the 20th of November. That's only five short weeks away. And for the love of all that is holy, the UK APMP end of year award show is obviously a must attend, virtually of course. That's going to be broadcast over these channels on Wednesday, December the 16th. Oh, and I need to tell you, we've extended our deadline for votes to October the 30th. You've got an extra two weeks to nominate the person or organisation of your choice. Use those votes wisely. Ladies and gentlemen, in the words of Lenny Kravitz, it ain't over till it's over, but it is now over. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe, stay well, and stay happy. From the BidX studios here in Manchester, have a great weekend. We'll see you on November the 20th. Take care. Goodbye. <laughs>